uh, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Nancy Lopez, who is a prof professor of sociology here at uh, University of New Mexico. Nancy is a product of the Lower East Side of New York City, the first in her family to graduate from college, una quisqueana, dominicana, New Yorkenia. Now she's a lobo. She's been here for quite some time, and I think that, uh, that Nancy fits in beautifully with, uh, with this state. She is the director of the Institute for the Study of Race and Social Justice, and Nancy has spearheaded a uh, caught hiring an equity hiring process at the University of New Mexico, which I believe ha has had great success in creating a, a more equitable uh, uh, working place at UNM. So, I want to welcome Nancy Lopez to talk about the census. Muchas gracias. Bienvenidos, familia. Bienvenido a Albuquerque. Welcome to Albuquerque. I wanted to spend my time with you today talking about the urgency of a complete count for the 2020 census if we want to advance equity. So the title is Who Counts? What's your street race? If you were walking down the street, what race do you think other Americans who do not know you personally would automatically assume you were based on what you look like. So the message, the big takeaway today is that there's two undercounts that we need to focus on. The undercount of people, but also the undercount that happens when we have useless race data to advance equity. So um, I wanna share some of the strategies that I think we can work on so that that doesn't happen. So, the, those three actions, right? What, are, what three actions will you take at the end of this um, conversation? I want you to turn to the person next to you and share what those are. I also wanna invite you to reflect on your own social location in systems of privilege, power, and inequality and resistance that none of us created, but we're all located in. And again, um, the idea is to promote intersectional equity so that we are making visible the invisible categories in your school. Think about the data you collect for registration. Think about the data you collect for programming as well as what you do in your curriculum and your hiring is a demonstrated commitment to equity and inclusion, part of the hiring of staff, of faculty, of administrators and leaders. We got that done at uh, UNM and I hope and I encourage all of you will do that. So, I want you to think about what message resonates with the vulnerable communities in your area. I talk about the lesson I learned from my mom, immigrant black Dominican woman from the Dominican Republic who told her five kids when they faced an injustice, no dejes que nadie te robe tu derecho. We all have a right to be counted. Don't let anyone rob you of your rights, right? No matter whether you're documented or not, you know the citizenship question has been removed. If um, you message by saying, you don't want anyone knocking on your door, you, want, you should fill out that form as soon as possible. It's private, it's confidential. And if a census worker reveals your identity, they are subject to five years in prison and a fine of $250,000, right? The data only become available 72 years after. So what are the stakes? The stakes are not only the funding for our schools, but also voting rights, fair housing, um, the allocation of uh, representatives to Congress. We have people power. We need to organize our charter schools so that we, and our um, schools and community-based organizations so that we are working towards a complete count. So everyone knows the census takes place once every 10 years and that the full day count is April 1st, right? The unit of analysis is the household, so anyone living in the household. There's a tremendous undercount of children, elderly, low income, and we have to make sure we message to our parents that if there's three families living in that household, every single person needs to be counted. And an accurate count 
will hurt us. It will reduce resources, and we cannot fix that accurate count after it's done. So um, it determines so much. So three ways to answer. For the first time, we're going to have internet. So you will be receiving a postcard with information on how to fill that out. There will also be the possibility of filling out the census through the phone um, and also via mail if you want a paper um, copy. There will be language interpreters available by phone. So there's many languages that will be available. It goes live on March 12th. So think about making activities that could um, reach out to those communities and say, look, this is a time we can help you fill this out. Um, if we don't get everyone counted in the community by sometime in July, it's too late. That's it. So basically, the count is happening March through sometime in July. After that, we have to live with those numbers for 10 years. So what are you going to do? Use the um, resources that the census has. There's a massive hiring effort right now. So um, uh, helping people understand that it does take time. You can apply, it'll take a couple of weeks, but that it is incredibly important that we get people who know the community to work there. What if all of your schools had an essay contest for every single grade and offered some small prize for the student who writes the best essay or the best art project? demonstrating the urgency of a complete count and what the census will mean to them. What if you opened your libraries and your computer rooms for families like mine that had a second grade education and would have no idea how to fill that out or might be afraid? What if, so it is true that you can't fill out the form for anyone, but you can offer assistance. What if we transformed our schools to do that? What about if you co-branded all of your activities going forward, whether it's a, a fair, a sporting event, where you have the census logo and you make a comment about, make sure you are counted. If you are not counted, you don't exist, and this is gonna affect the next generation for years. What if you use your communication strategy to make sure that you, again, are mentioning the census on your signature for all your emails, for so all of your social media, um, your newsletter, any activity that is taking place in the community. What if? Now I'll turn to my second um, point, which is not only are we concerned about an undercount in terms of people, because obviously those are the numbers that are gonna be used for all of those other purposes, but we also use this data to advance equity about opportunity structures and the color line. So I'm sure you've heard the term intersectionality and it's a nice way of summarizing that if we want to advance equity for everyone, particularly the vulnerable communities, we have to understand that inequality is very complicated, that we must look at race, gender, immigration status. We must look at um, sexual orientation, disability status together in order to get a more complete picture. Um, the other part about intersectionality is that we must be self-critical at all times. We must always be looking at ourselves. And this quote from the Kwambi River Collective um, says it very plainly. We are committed to continual examination of our politics through self-criticism. So always be aware of that. This is a visual that helps us understand how we are all located in systems of inequality that we didn't create. So the importance of recognizing that you have, um, that we may be implicated in these systems, whether it's class, gender, sexual orientation, and that we should never conflate ancestry with race or uh, ethnicity, et cetera. And that we must always look at issues of disability um, and so on. This is another visual from um, Patricia Hill Collins black feminist thought that talks about how we can't only focus on the individual level inequities that we experience as individuals, but that we have to look at organizations, right? We have to look at structural racism, settler colonialism, racialized capitalism, and make sure that we're looking at institutional processes, rules of the game, et cetera. And also, what are those ideologies that might may be maintaining inequities in our schools, like the myth of a meritocracy, right? Um, this visual also represents what most people think of when they're thinking about the Latinx community, the Latino community. They think of a brown-skinned young woman, maybe not black-looking, but certainly not white-looking. But we know that anyone in this room could be Hispanic. 
It just means that you have some ancestry from um, a Latino group. So it is incredibly important for us not to conflate your ethnicity, your national origin with race. Color blindness is not anti-racism. Anti-racism begins with the understanding, understanding the institutional nature of racial matters and accepting that everyone is racialized and affected materially and ideologically by the racial structure. That's from Bonilla Silva, Racism Without Racists. Here's a wonderful little survey that included an item that asked people to surmise how others see them on the street. And we noticed that, and this was done here in New Mexico, it's the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance Survey, that for whites, that when you ask people who identify their own identity as white, that 98% said, yeah, I think other people socially see me as white. For those that were multiracial, more than half said, I think other people on the street see me as white, right? For those who said some other race, most of those are Latinos, uh, th over a third. Um, for Hispanic, 15% said, I think others see me as white. For Native American, the number is pretty small, 6%. But guess what, in New Mexico, if you said, I identify as black or Asian, zero people thought you were white. So why does this matter? Um, this is a question that I, um, was included in a publication that came out on the sociology of race and ethnicity that asked that question of about 1,500 Latinos. And we see that everyday um, experiences with discrimination, whether it's housing, employment, differs. I just got back last night from the University of Berlin that just started a master's program on intersectionality and politics. And one of my colegas that was on my panel presented this question they're using in Germany. <laughs> which is saying, oh, okay, so people sometimes identify in many ways. Do you see yourself as whatever? And then they also ask, people experience social description, group belongings by others every day, even if they don't belong to that group. Are you ascribed to belong to one of these groups? That's again, understanding that race is a, a social construction and a social status. Um, look at these three handsome men. Does anyone recognize them? They're all Latinx. I have cousins that look like every single one of them. But the research data on voting rights, on employment, on incarceration will tell you that they're all going to experience race very differently. They're all Latinx. So that is why I've been suggesting that we look at the race question on the census. And even if you're in the same family, you may have members who are siblings who look very different. And if we don't answer that question to reflect your street race, we will not have good data. And if we mark 15 things on the census saying, well, we're all mixed race, then that's useless data for us to understand. I think you all remember that President Obama was chided for marking only one box. And my assumption is that he understands that that is data that is being used to determine whether or not there are inequities that fall along the color line. This is what you're all going to be getting in the mail in March, April. And I want you to take note of the troubling wording. First of all, we are going to be asked, we're still going to ask, are you Hispanic? I'm going to say yes, I'm Dominican. My daughters are Chicana, Dominicanas. They'll probably check um, both of those boxes. The second question says, what is this person's race? And under each race box, there's a suggested nationality or ancestry. And I ask the census designers at many venues that I happen to talk to them about, and I said, okay, so if nationality or ethnicity is linked to a race box, where are you going to put Canadian? Where are you going to put South African? What about American? Nationalities and race should never be linked. These are two totally different social constructions. And while it sounds really great, to say we want to collect detailed information on the, on the ancestries of our population, that's great. Ask a different question. And it actually does exist in the American Community Survey, which is sent to 3.5 million households every year. So that is a different thing. This is the convergence of colorblind racism, eugenesis, and nativist projects. And so I did write a piece in theconversation.com that says the Census Bureau keeps confusing race and ethnicity. And I'm happy to report that it's being used um, in the online platform for um, teachers in K-12. So again, I ask you to think about my three handsome men here and how each of them would answer that question and how you would answer that question. 
particularly if you are in a household where people occupy different master statuses in terms of their street race, right? So it's very clear that we would have very different answers there. The question is there is no brown box, right? And so I imagine that most people, if they saw George Lopez walking down the street, would assume that he has some indigenous ancestry. And interestingly enough, the only box that includes any suggested Hispanic origin group is the indigenous box, as if though there are no Afro-Latinos or white Latinos. But in any case, the, the question would be, would it be meaningful to use that box to signify that you're brown? And I raise that question. I want you to look at these very um, beautiful <laughs> women, right? And recognize they're all mixed race, right? So a lot of people say, well, I'm gonna ch check five boxes because I have five ancestries. And in this case here, it's like four or three. How is that gonna help us understand? Again, this is why I ask myself, if we have the ability to change our forms to understand who's most likely to be sent to in-school sus suspension room, we know there's mixed race kids in gifted classes. We know that there's mixed race kids in the dual enrolled classes, right? But do we know if there's a color line being replicated, whether or not it's intentional or accidental? So again, I ask you to think about how these data are gonna be used. So what's your racial ontology? How do you understand race? Race, like gender, is a master social status, right? We can all have our very unique identities, but when we look at how we're being treated based on what we look like, when we go vote, who gets asked for extra identification, when you go apply for a mortgage or an apartment, who is going to be stopped by law enforcement, or even while shopping, we know that street race matters, right? This is another visual, comes from one of the books that I co-edited called Mapping Race that says the only place that we collect data on is the um, self-identity, which is important, but we also need that other question. Ethnicity also matters, but that's a different question. This is just all the data that exists showing all the empirical studies that even poverty rates for white Latinos look very different than for brown and black indigenous and or um, uh, other Latinos. Who ever heard about this incident? So this is a reporter from Univision, a black Colombian immigrant woman who announced that she was a woman of color coming to interview a member of the KKK. Was absolutely fine, but when my sister showed up, she was th her life was threatened. So he was ex obviously expecting someone who looked quite different. So thinking about the fact that 90% of enslaved Africans were taken to Latin America and uh, the Caribbean, but only 3% of Latinos check that they are black. So thinking about that education project, only 1% of Latinos in the 2010 census identified as indigenous. When we know that the children that are in cages are most likely to look like this young woman here. And we have no data to represent that reality, right? And the census every year gets um, a request to erase any race data. So, what I want you to think about um, is how these data are being used and how this is part of larger racist racial projects that are um, trying to dismantle the gains of the civil rights um, project. And w the truth is that we have to ask the question, who benefits when we erase data on the color line? What is, we talk about white fragility, the discomfort that people may feel recognizing that there are inequities that fall along the color line. The same thing is happening in the Latino community. Privileged blinds, whether you're in Latin America, the Caribbean, Spain, or even in the United States, there's a preponderance of interdisciplinary evidence that shows that there's a color line that shapes access to opportunity in Latinx communities and families and society. Ignoring that reality, is not gonna help us advance equity in voting, housing, employment, or criminal justice. Um, we need to disinvest from colorblindness. So are we a post-racial society? What would ethical data collection look like? Should we use one question to measure two concepts, race and origin? Would you measure the, one, the following with one question, gender or sexual orientation, educational attainment or occupational status, income or wealth? 
SIP code is not a proxy for disadvantage, and I know that the SAT just announced that they are going to use an adversity score, which may mask real inequities, right? What is the census afraid of? We need ethical accuracy for social justice, not aesthetic accuracy for compliance only. It's useful to think about race as street race or a social status that has nothing to do with your DNA test. It has to do with the, the relationship of power that happens when people assign meaning to what you look like. And um, what will you do? So this is where I wanna take two or three minutes to have you each think about this question and exchange it. And if we still have um, two minutes, I'll have someone share back. What are you going to do with your intersectionality lens to center the lives of vulnerable communities and provide what my colleague, um, Professor Ruth Sambrana at University of Maryland has called intersectional equity lifts? How are you going to incorporate um, street race into the census curriculum? Will you open schools at least one day a week so that parents that don't have computers and need help and are afraid can come and get assistance? Will you create essay contests? Will you have a mural art project? Will you tell people about street race and what these data are used for? Will we continue to conduct rigorous research that looks at intersecting inequalities? Will we file a complaint with the Government Office of Accountability at the, um, at, in Capitol Hill saying, right now the testing the census is doing is not looking at any of the interdisciplinary evidence that shows that there is a color line in the Latino community and other communities? Charter schools can lead the way on intersectional data collection for social justice. Why, um, why don't we collect data on parental educational attainment for all of our students? Here's a poster that my colleague at the University of, um, she's actually at the University of Hanover in Germany, but she shared with me, think about ways that you can create incentives for people to create posters. You don't count if you're not counted was their um, uh, saying. And then I wanted to show this visual because it shows a, a study that was published in the Race, Ethnicity, and Education Journal that I co-authored with my colleagues that looks at the odds of graduating by using intersectional analysis. So instead of saying, we're just gonna look at the odds of graduating by race or class or gender, we actually created 20 social locations and said, if we compare everyone's graduation to that of high income white women over a decade, do we see disparities? And here you see from the group that experiences the highest disparity to the groups that don't experience any disparity in, gradu in the odds of graduating many things that would have remained invisible. What it shows is that, for instance, American Indian high-income men are 37% less likely to graduate than high-income white women. So are low-income um, black men, I'm sorry, low-income white men and high-income black men are 30% less likely. So this data could be used to revise things like the funding formula for higher ed that assumes that your um, Pell status is a proxy for the racial gap. They never assume that for gender, but for some reason the idea is that income is a substitute for racial gaps. And clearly if you do intersectional analysis, you will uncover some complex inequalities. So I urge all of you to look at that. What is your wish list for rigorous data collection to make the invisible visible? I did do a TEDx talk in Spanish that's available at race.unm.edu that was meant to meet, um, reach vulnerable audiences. I mentioned this um, conversation.com piece. Um, the Census Bureau keeps confusing race and ethnicity as something that you can share with folks so that they understand the importance of good race data for looking at segregation. And here's where I, if time permits, I will ask each of you to answer these two questions at your table for the next three minutes. <laughs> What three actions will you commit to doing in your schools to mitigate the undercount of people with a strategic focus on those vulnerable communities that we know are consistently undercounted? And number two, what will you do to explain what the race question is asking for? Data to examine the color line for, for advancing equity. Again, let me, I'm going to put my timer for three minutes. Just turn to the person next to you because obviously we don't have time, but I just want to hear what ideas come up for you about how to mitigate the undercount of vulnerable communities. So three minutes. Turn to the person next to you, and then we, we'll still have three minutes, I think. 
All right. I've just been told we have two minutes, so I want someone to yell out what strategic thing or action you will take, because we have two minutes. Raise your hand. Sí, por favor, quickly. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do a share out for one and a half minutes. <laughs> um, mural wall art. Did everyone hear that? Mural wall art. Who else? If you want to come up, we still have about a minute. Just share an idea. A mock census at schools so that families are having these conversations at home. Mock census at schools so that families are having the conversation. What else? Strategic action, vulnerable communities, undercounts. So we heard mural, a mock census, any other ideas that we can think of? Who's going to do the essay contest to mobilize our youth? Who's going to open their schools one day a week, maybe in the mornings, so that um, families that are afraid will be able to come? All right, I saw a hand here. Who was it? Who was the hand? Nobody? <laughs> Any other idea people want to share? Because now we have 30 seconds. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. And I know there's another, a third speaker. So thank you all. Visit our website. Um, there's a lot of resources, videos up there.